Matthew chapter 7. While you're looking there, you can, looking for that, you can bow your hearts with me and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we can thank you all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough for what you sent your son to do for us on a cross 2,000 years ago. And we know, Father, that if there was another way, you would have made it possible. Yes. But there wasn't. We know that it's only through Jesus that we go to heaven. That there are people in our country and in our world who have a challenge with that. They say that that's bigotrous and racist and other things, Lord, but it's your word. It's your way. It's your design. We're not here to judge you, Father. You took care of all of that for us on the cross. Lord, bless our service. Bless the words that are uh, said here today. Let our eyes and minds and hearts be open to what you would have for us to hear. Bless me and more of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 7, Matthew. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet it, shall be measured to you again. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in your own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So the story goes, and I don't know if I can represent the story as well as, as, well as it deserves, but this is supposed to be a black guy. I don't have a black magic marker, so I figure if I color in, several colors, you'll think it's black. But the story goes that the professor, I don't know if he was a psychology or a uh, philosophy professor or whatever it was, that the class came and got seated. And when class got started, he said that we're gonna have a, a pop quiz. And he passed out the quiz to each of the students and had them turn it over so nobody could see it. And as the story goes, once everybody received their paper, he had them to turn it over and look at it. And when they looked at it, all that they saw was a black dot right in the middle of the page. There were no questions, there were no words, no numbers, no letters, nothing. Just a black dot in the middle of the page. And the story goes that the professor said, I want you to write an essay and explain to me what you see. And so the students, needless to say, were rather bum-fuzzled and confused. But some of them began to start writing. Eventually, everyone wrote. And when they finished, they all handed their papers in. And he started to read what people wrote out loud to the rest of the class. He didn't tell them who it was, but he read what was written. And as he read it, there were uh, students who were very logical, and they said, in this test, there is a black dot. It's in the center. It's so many inches from the side and so many inches from the top. Others were a little bit more creative and said it is like a black hole and uh, it's in the center and so forth and so on. But the professor said, the professor said, things aren't always as they seem. And I don't know if you've noticed that. That seems to be what the Lord has been working with me on the past few weeks kind of a uh, theme, things aren't always as we see them. 
things are not always what they seem to be. And that's why the scripture tells us to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And I truly don't even think that that's enough for us to really understand someone else's situation and position. But the professor said there's one thing that nobody did in this class. And he said nobody said anything about all the white space around the black dot. He said everybody focused on the black dot in the middle. And some of you were quite creative in, in coming up with different things, and some of you were logical and mathematical. He's like, but nobody said anything about all the empty white space that's around it. Things are not always as we seem. When we think about other people, whether they're Christians or not, whether we believe they're Christian or not, or whether their heart is right with the Lord, or whether it's very, whether they're very open and say that they don't believe in God and they're not a Christian and whatever the case might be, I think it's too easy for us to look at other people and see the black dot. We see the dot in the middle of the page and we make the necessary obvious assumptions that this person is this, this person is that, they think this, they feel that, etc. And we make those assumptions based on our own personal experiences. The scripture tells us in Matthew, it doesn't specifically say judge not, but it says, judge not, lest ye be judged by the same measure in which you use. In other words, if you're harsh and you're difficult in your judgment of someone, that's what you can expect to receive back because that's what you put out. It says, cast your bread upon the water and it'll come back. And to sow your seeds and you'll reap what you sow. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. If I plant corn and I expect to get carrots, I'm going to be pretty disappointed. If I plant judgment and I expect grace, I'm going to be pretty disappointed. Because that's just not how it works. Our words have power. God said in the beginning, let there be light, and there was. And from that moment forward in human history, as we understand history as humans chronologically, God set into motion the power of our tongue. Many Christians uh, who've been in church a while probably have heard this, but pound for pound, the strongest muscle in your body is your tongue. Your tongue, not to be too graphic, has been tested and how much weight that your tongue can hold compared to the size of your tongue, pound for pound, can hold more weight than any other muscle in your body. And it says there's nothing, Scripture says there's nothing more difficult to tame than the human tongue, than our mouths. It's one thing to look at the dot and you see something, you make a... a judgment call, you make an assumption about these person or people, but it's another thing to vocalize that and act upon it. The scripture says that every thought should be captured. Every thought should be filtered through the blood of Christ. It's too easy for us to look at the black dot and say, there's a black dot in the center of the thing. There's it's dirty, it's ugly, it's, uh, it's not perfectly round, it's not perfectly centered, it's whatever. But we're failing to see all the other stuff that surrounds it. We're failing to see and notice, and I always use homeless people because it's such an easy example. We see them with their sign. And we make, it a, we make a judgment call. We look at them, we look at their shoes, and we look at their clothes, and we look at if their face is clean, and we make a judgment call. Are they really homeless? Are they just scamming? Do they looking for money for alcohol or drugs? And the bottom line comes down to, you'll not know 
unless you're willing to actually step out of your vehicle and go and speak to them, which most of us won't do, or you just put it in God's hands and trust that if God says, bless them, bless them. If God says, no, not right now, then it's not your turn to do it. And to trust God that it's all taken care of. To trust God with all the white space that surrounds a black guy. Because we can't possibly know everybody's circumstances and all their details. And the people that we probably judge the most are family, our, our nuclear family, and our church family. It's too easy. Because we're close to each other. And we see each other's flaws. And we know the things that, that we each do and don't do and should and shouldn't do and so forth. And it's easy to make a judgment call. Now, it's one thing to go to somebody and say, hey, I wish you wouldn't do this around me because it makes me uncomfortable. It's another thing to say, that's a sin and you're not going to heaven and there's a problem with you, etc. I try to encourage people and I'll close with this. When I talk to young Christians, young in the faith, when I talk to uh, people who are maybe a little bit wobbly in their faith, I remind them of two things. First and foremost, when you got saved, you accepted the forgiveness that God created for us on the cross through his son by the power of the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago. When you accepted that forgiveness, God didn't expect perfection from you and never a sin again. We should strive for that. But when God died for you on the cross 2,000 years ago, he died for all of your sins. It's our responsibility to not do it. It's our responsibility to repent when we do do it. It's our responsibility to go and sin no more, as Jesus said to the harlot while she was about to be stoned to death. He didn't, he didn't pacify her and say, it's okay, honey, and let her go. He protected her from death and said, now go sin no more. So we have to remember that if God died for our sins prior to our salvation, he's just as strong to forgive us of our sins after our salvation, after that point that we accepted him. The second thing that we need to remind our young Christians or, or people that are weak in the faith is the devil is a liar. Nothing that comes from his mouth is ever true. He'll always take a nugget of truth from the scripture and twist it. There is never a thing that comes out of his mouth that isn't true. Because everything that the devil does, everything that Lucifer wants to do, is an exact reverse replica of what God did. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Satan, the Beast, and the Antichrist. He says, I'll give you all these kingdoms to the world to Jesus if you'll cast yourself down. Jesus says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. There's nothing that he says. So when he comes to you and says, you're just a wretched sinner. You're no good. You judge people too much. You need to change this thing in your life or that thing. That this sin that you struggle with is going to prevent you from getting into heaven. All these things that Satan says, he's a liar. He's trying to trip you up. He's trying to get you so focused on the die. Yeah. Your sin, your flaw, that thing that, that trips you up frequently, that you lose sight of all the love, the purity, the Holy Spirit, the power of God, and everything else around you. He's a liar. And when he comes in, we need to rebuke him. We need to remind ourselves with the scripture that he is a liar and that God is not. And that is the power of knowing the scripture from memory. And if we can't do that for whatever reason, 
whether it's medical or whatever the case might be, open your Bible up and look and remind yourself, God said that I am a saint. God said that I am saved. God said that I am sanctified. He said that I have joy, that I should rejoice, that I can have power over these things in my life, that Satan is a liar, that he hates us, that he wants to take us down with him as much as possible, as many as he can. So much so that the Lord has had to expand the gates of hell to fulfill and fit the souls of those who have chosen to live their lives without God. It's sad and scary. But we have to encourage one another. We have to lift one another up. And we have to remind each other, Satan's a liar. And when God died for our sins, he died for all of them. Not just some of them. Not just the ones before we accepted Christ. But all of them. And we need to turn from anything that is wicked, that is not of God, and turn towards God. Stand. We need to get our eyes off the dot. And we need to step back and expand our vision and look at the whole. And let me just say this. When we're judging somebody else... We're judging ourselves. Because you can't see something wrong in somebody else that isn't also wrong in you. I can't see the wrong that you're doing and point it out if I myself haven't experienced that wrong or haven't dealt with that, whether I'm still struggling with it or whether I've overcome it. We need to back up and say what's important isn't this struggle and this sin. What's important is this person. What's important is their soul. What's important is that I love them and encourage them and lift them up. That doesn't mean we pacify them and tell them it's okay, do whatever you want to do. Jesus didn't do that. He said, go and sin no more. But he did it out of love. And he taught her and said, where are thou accusers? They're gone. Right? Why? Because I firmly believe, and I can't prove it in scripture, but I firmly believe the person that she was caught in the act with was one of those men that was going to throw a stone. I don't know that for a fact. That's just my own personal belief. Because it makes perfect sense. Because that's how we are as humans. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, Father. We thank you for your message, Lord. I pray today that we take our focus off of God in the center. Lord, I pray that we take a step back and we look at the whole. We look at someone as a soul, as a human being who has an eternal soul, and we want to encourage them to accept Christ and to go to heaven with us. Lord, if that encouragement means uh, a few dollars to help them get some food or a, a ride somewhere or maybe it's just a, an encouraging word to say, hey look, I had the same struggle. I deal with it myself still. Let's do it together. Let's be accountable to each other. Let's help each other. Instead of beating them down and judging, that's terrible. I can't believe you did that. Let us reach to each of these souls and everyone, billions upon billions of people who are counting on us to encourage them and help them with their walk to heaven until that day that the Lord takes us. Whether that day be by natural causes through death or whether that day be by the rapture, Lord. Whatever it is, let us take everyone that we can possibly take with us. Bless us, Lord, in our travels as we prepare to leave today until we come back again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.